Welcome to Managing Sexuality Intelligently with Stephen Ng, Marriage and Family Therapist. My name is Jason. And my name is Stephen Ng. And we're just going to chat about a topic that I worked on ahead of time, and we're just going to explore that topic. So that's essentially what we do here. What are we talking about today? Today, we're talking about something that you brought up a few times in previous podcast episodes, and that is 30 dates. (laughs) (laughs) So I want to kind of, so a few times he's mentioned that he believes that people should go on at least 30 dates prior to, I don't know, maybe getting into something more significant or there's some sort of relevance around 30 dates. And I just want to kind of get into that. Like, is this a set number? Why do you have this philosophy? What are you trying to learn about on these dates? And yeah, just have an open discussion about dating and kind of get into all that. So like your thought process behind that. And maybe we could start by how many dates have you been on <laughs> in your life? Um, not nearly enough, I think, <laughs> but but something close to that. And I, um, I'm the reason I'm laughing nervously thinking about this topic is because it it just seems to strike people uh, so strongly, and and so here's here's the message that I generally share with my clients who are newly divorced or just got getting out of prison and, and they've been single for years, and or or young men who are say incels and they're just now climbing out of their grandparents' basement and, and giving <laughs> up the you know the internet. Um, I always encourage them to consider going on 30 um, dating experiences. And by that, I do not mean 30 dates with the same women, but what I mean is dating at least 30 women. All right. Do so, people say like, whoa, who do you think I am? Like Brad Pitt? It's like, <laughs> come on, Steve. It's like. Well, people do have uh, different reactions. The men have different reactions. And the, the women find it pretty non-threatening in general, but the men... Um, of course they're, they're rather a surprised because I think they're thinking and this, okay, there is a strategy to why I say what I say, mostly because it breaks up some of the pre-existing irrational beliefs because most guys, what they're looking for is a girlfriend. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah. Because <laughs> what we should all be looking for is the right girlfriend. Mm, all right. We don't need a girlfriend. We yeah. need the right girlfriend. And being able to discriminate uh, between all the posers <laughs> who are auditioning for a leading role in the epic film that is my life and the people who are really right for the job, that takes some time. And, and it takes, I think, some education. And some of these dates, and, and if you're a parent listening to this for your for your young teenager, I would encourage you to kind of listen up because this is going to be appropriate for them. Or if you have a friend who's newly single, we all know the stories of the desperately needy person who ends up with the first person who made a play for them, right? Yeah. I feel like that happens all the time. It does. I've seen it happen with friends and it's like they get out of a relationship and it almost seems like they don't have the strength, not to talk down about them, but it's like they don't have the strength to be single and to be alone and to work through those issues of neediness and loneliness in order to get out the the other side. So they just get into the first relationship that they right. What we would call a, uh, don't we used to call, didn't we used to call them ping pong relationships or like rebound rebounding Mm -hmm. really? Yeah. You know, and, and to just acknowledge intelligently to myself, Hey, I'm at a point in my life where I'm kind of needy and vulnerable. Mm-hmm. And for a lot of people, the remedy then is repress. Repr- I'm not going to go on any dates with anybody. Mm-hmm. Well, I waited a year before I went on my first date. I would not suggest that. I mean, okay. I, I don't think there's any particular timetable. But when you're ready or you, there's somebody that's interesting to you to be open to dating, I think is a good idea. And as we all know, those of us who've dated a bit. Um, There are a number of people out there and I'm going to be speaking heteronormatively of my, of myself as a man dating women. But of course this applies in reverse from women to men and, and in um, same sex relationships, it's exactly the same. I'm, there are a lot of dates 
where one date is enough. Uh, there, there's not going to be a callback. Uh, there will be no second date. That counts as one. And so, that's because of just something that, like, you're just not vibing. You're not, like, like that's, there's more, like, there's something, like, you want to, there's something that's off or is something that there's a deal breaker or. Yeah. And we've joked about this before mm -hmm. you and I, I mean, you find that you ask her about her Nazi tattoo yeah, and you find out, oh, this is a big part of her life mm -hmm. and she's still into it. And, uh, or you find out that she hates something that you find very dear. And after yeah. talking to her a bit about this, you realize, yeah, this is not likely to change in the near future. And mm -hmm. I'm going to have to keep uh, my love of opera to myself uh, <laughs> or my love of books to myself and, uh, or I'm going to upset her. So, or, or she says, um, well, yeah, I like sex. I mean, in all my relationships, I've had sex, both of them. And, I had sex um, one time with the first guy in our first 10 years. <laughs> and, you know, for me, uh, that's just not going to work. Yeah. And so I would, there are a lot of things you find out, you know, if you're doing, if you're being a good interviewer in the, and you're conducting a, a, an enjoyable, intentional interview, you find out some things, not maybe even deliberately, but quite serendipitously that make it really clear you're with somebody who's really not a contender. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's a one and done. And there are other people who are going to be um, a, a two date option. And mm. then you realize, yeah, there's just, I mean, she's attractive and everything, but there's just no there there. I'm not really enjoying conversation with her. It just feels really awkward. Even after I said, gosh, sometimes it feels really awkward when I'm talking to you. She had nothing. She had yeah. nothing to say. And uh, and then there are others who actually make it to a whole third date. And then you're absolutely sure you don't want to date her again. So, you know, when we say 30 dates, it can sound intimidating. But you could easily, if you were dating somebody, you know, some individuals once a week, you could easily knock out 30 dates in a year. Yeah. Um, Although maybe it would take two or three years because some other dates are going, you're going to be dating them uh, 10 times, 30, mm -hmm. 20 or 30 times. There might yeah. be some that are six month long relationships. And in all of this, here's what my, my evil plan to take over the world is. <laughs> my, uh, my brain is evaluating and comparing mm -hmm. uh, the different women who come into my life. And just like when you go into a supermarket, you're doing some comparison shopping. Mm -hmm. And some of these women, in my experience, are so amazing that they transcend what I ever thought women were even capable of. I didn't even know there were women like that on the planet. Yeah. Didn't realize that that was on the menu. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, oh, and if there's one, there might be more than one. So, gee, this is really interesting. I know for me as a recovering codependent it was always really important for me to date fixer-uppers and women i could take care of because that, that's part of how i defined masculinity was the man who takes care mm -hmm. of you know the little lady yeah and to meet women who were actually adults it was stupefying i, I was dumbfounded I, I just and this is when you were like in your 30s right right and i i just was in awe of mm -hmm. not only the women themselves but the the the, the response within me was, it was so pleasurable to have a truly adult conversation. And it didn't matter whether we agreed on things or didn't agree. It was just such a, a truly pleasurable conversation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I think of 30, I don't even think it's all that many, but I, I really trust, I have a faith that says the truth is our friend. And whatever the truth is in that dating experience, the truth that's revealed, a lot of it is going to be revealed about me. Mm -hmm. So let's say I've had, um, and I have had horrible relationships, but let's say I'm coming off of a horrible relationship that lasted, say, 10 years or five years. Mm -hmm. Well, any thinking person is going to look in the mirror and say, well, as bad as that relationship was, I did pick them. Yeah. It was not an arranged relationship. And I decided to stay with them for every day of the, that time period we were together. So what does that say about me? 
And what you find when you start dating others following that dismal other relationship, you I found that even though I could have different thoughts in my head, my picker was still impaired. Yeah. I was still picking fixer uppers. Oh, they were getting better, but it was more like one rung of the ladder at a time. Mm. It wasn't like an epic change or a totally different model, a different paradigm. It was just very gradual and incremental because I was only gradually and incrementally getting healthier. Mm. So as messed up as I was, how could I pick great people to get involved with? That would have been by accident only. Yeah. And I don't even know if I would have been ready to deal with that if I had met somebody who was more significantly evolved than mm -hmm. I was. I, 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 don't, I can't even imagine that. Nor can I imagine a woman who is more significantly evolved wanting to date a guy like me uh, at that time. So, Do you find it hard, though, for people even to admit that their picker is off? Oh, yeah. Nobody wants that, to admit that, right? Yeah. I mean, that my picker was impaired and that I... That's a hard thing to say three mm -hmm. times quickly, <laughs> but to say, um, because our, our normal human inclination is to want to blame the other, but mm -hmm. it is so, I just want to, if I could sell the listeners on this, what's so empowering about self-examination following a disastrous romance is that you really get to look at what part of you attracts that kind of person and then go follows through and chooses that kind of person or accepts mm -hmm. that kind of person because that part of it is about you. I know it takes two to tango, but there is a significant part of the whole experience that really is about me because at any time, whether you're male or female, you can always drop your arms and walk off the dance floor. Mm -hmm. You always get to say, hey, I appreciate getting to know you, but uh, this just isn't working for me. I got to yeah. go. And I didn't have those words in my mouth to say. Yeah. And I was always afraid of hurting the other person's feelings. But if you think about it, I hope everybody out there is thinking about this. It's when you let another person know that it's not working for you, you're giving them a huge gift. Mm -hmm. because, And it's the gift of time. Um, because you're doing them no favors staying with them and occupying time in their life when you know you're not right for each other yeah and it doesn't mean they're a bad person it doesn't mean she's a bad woman or that she won't find happiness with some other guy because i've seen that happen too many times where the person who's not right for me well i got rejected by many <laughs> of the women who dated me but my, my but they left you they're like i'm only on number five i got 25 more to go oh yeah you've got a lot more and you know it's going to be and the other thing about this 30 is it may seem daunting. I suppose, you know, even listening to you today, some of it is, oh, God, it just sounds like so much work. But it's really not. It's really, it's, there are very few pleasures that transcend the pleasure of getting to know an interesting person. Yeah. And even if she's not the right woman for you or me, just the pleasure of getting to know her is so enjoyable. I think it's worth a date or two to have that experience. Well, well that I think is too, just um, the value to it. Like we say with the intentional interview that it's, it's, enjo it's an enjoyable process. And rather than having the expectation like, okay, we're going on a coffee date. Um, then we're going to get married. We're going to like have kids, like right, planning right. all that. It's like, just take a breath and just get to know the person without all the pressure of even any of that stuff. Oh yeah, that's that's so so true. And that's really what it takes is letting go of that pressure that I don't have to close the sale here. Yeah. You know, it's not important for me to get a signature on the dotted line and mm -hmm. so I can go back to the office with a signed contract. Yeah. It's it's not like that. It's really an exploration. It's like going for a walk. You're just yeah. you know, checking out this new neighborhood or this new trail that you found and you're just exploring it and it's and it's, you know, the win isn't that you're, you're going to, it's going to be the best walk you ever had or mm -hmm. the best trail you've ever found. It's you're exploring and it's, you're learning a little bit more about the earth and yourself in the process. So, you know, I, I think what happens, you know, our onboard search engine is our brain, right? Mm -hmm. 
And our brain is doing an incredible job of multitasking in terms of evaluating human beings around us and who would be right, who's not right, um, who's enjoyable, who's not enjoyable, um, tasked with getting to know someone, whether or not I decide to stay with them or not. These are all very um, uh, bandwidth consuming activities. And when I do get to know people in this way, and then I move on, I'm also teaching my natural intelligence, not my artificial intelligence. There's like machine learning. My brain is learning a little more about what I want, mm -hmm. a little bit more about what I need. And sometimes it's through the helpful words of the woman you're dating. You know, she'll say something that is so spot on, so very right. And you realize in that moment that you too should be thinking that way. You too should be evaluating people in that way. So the people we know are triggering epigenetically, they're triggering our, our genome to be smarter and more, more um, connected to what's happening around us. Because a lot of us, frankly, we may not be autistic, but we, we behave as though we were. We're not reading the room. Mm. We're not reading the conversation. We're not really getting what's being laid out. And that's how we get caught up in these disastrous relationships where, you know, she finds she's getting abused or he finds that mm. he's with someone uh, who doesn't really love him or vice versa. Um, it's just, yeah, this is, this is a very educational process and not all that time consuming. Now, ideally... If you had perfect parents, maybe some of this would be happening when you're, you know, a teenager. And like the dates are saying? Yeah, yeah. And they would have encouraged you through high school or mm -hmm. they would have modeled the behavior, mm -hmm. uh, even a single. You know, one of the things I, I regret is when I hear single parents say, well, I don't bring anybody home unless I'm sure. Mm. You know, I don't want my kids meeting anybody, you know, one yeah. week. And, and Yeah, then, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I just think it's unfortunate because it, it, I know that I understand the desire to protect one's children mm -hmm. from, but really what they're talking about is protecting, it's like protecting children from finding out Santa isn't real. Mm. To find out that not all relationships are happily ever after. Yeah. I think that's a very important lesson for mm. all young people to learn yeah. and also for I, I don't believe in necessarily processing difficult adult um, ideas in front of children but i think dating is one of those very light-hearted sort of adult activities that we can process in front of our children and so when the children say well dad why aren't you dating susan anymore mm -hmm. And I've never dated a woman named Susan, so the world is, it can be safe. Um, why, you know, why aren't you dating Susan anymore? Oh, well, we just weren't right for each other. What do you mean by that, Dad? You know, well, you know, I'm the kind of person who really likes a quiet life, and Susan really loves to party, mm -hmm. and that really, you know, going out all the time is really an important part of her life right now. See, I can say that without putting Susan down or making it sound like. I'm the good person and Susan is some kind of, some kind of second class person. It's just I'm teaching my children then that it's okay to evaluate for compatibility. Yeah. And it's also okay to say, you know, I think Susan has a drinking problem. And mm -hmm. I just, uh, I don't know if you know this about me, but I'm just not comfortable around people who, who have a drinking problem and are not doing anything about it. Mm -hmm. Well, why is that? Dad? I mean, just she likes to party once in a while. What's the problem? <laughs> and then to talk about why that would be a problem. Well, because yeah. I don't feel like I'm with her when she's had a couple of drinks in her. It doesn't feel like we're really together. I feel like my I sort of disappear. Mm -hmm. And I think all of those little ideas get put into a child's brain and get processed as the years go by. So even if somebody was single for years and they were single parent, in that time, I think it's really wonderful to bring people in or have people over for dinner or for a movie or what a barbecue or whatever it is people do uh, in those kind of dating situations. Mm -hmm. I think it's okay too for the children to like them and to really wish, God, I hope 
dad marries this one, or I hope yeah. dad doesn't dump her. <laughs> and then, and then to hear your kids process that mm. because they get to have their thoughts and their feelings as well. And I, I just think protecting children from that process is utterly unnecessary and unhelpful. Uh, and and uh, cause we're not talking in any of these examples of a, a potential mate who is um, abusing you in front of your children. Yeah. That's what I was going to like, maybe mention like you have to be kind of savvy. And if that is happening to leave that before you bring it. <laughs> right. And I think it would be okay to talk about abusive behavior mm -hmm. with your children, even at a very young age, because that too is part of their learning curve and to learn because I never did hear my mother say when in her single years, Oh yeah, I stopped dating him because I found out he was abusive. Mm. And I I never heard her say that. Yeah. Because that sentence was not one that was hers to say. Mm -hmm. She never thought of thought it through. And she wouldn't have had the words to describe it in that succinct sort of way that would be very informative. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, he just couldn't respect women. I never heard my mom say anything like that, but I knew that she must have dated men who were sexist or who didn't respect her for one reason or another. And she must have had an experience like that. And yet we never processed any of her dating experiences. Mm -hmm. And you, But you think it would have helped you? Oh, yeah. yeah. I would have put the whole thing because for, it would have put the whole thing on my right, radar in terms of my intellect because I would have at least been thinking about it, mm -hmm. even if I was very wrong in my thoughts. Yeah. And, if, and, and if I had thought, oh, well, she should have kept dating him. He was one of the good ones. And if I'd had the confidence or the safety in the home to say that out loud and to have a, a, a parent say, well, what makes you think that? What did you like about them? Mm -hmm. Well, would it change your mind if they were, you know, blah, 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 fill in the blank? And that would have been an incredibly informative conversation. Yeah. You know, the truth is we're all – unique, you know, uh, at the risk again of being labeled a liberal, every, every <laughs> one of us is truly unique, like a snowflake uh -huh. and that, and we don't match every other person who's looking for someone out there. Mm -hmm. There are, there are far more non matches than there are matches. Yeah. And to just say, well, we we're both needy and lonely. That's why we're together. That's a horrible, <laughs> horrible idea. Right. I, would I feel like, like that's think. a lot of relationships. <laughs> well, it is. It really is a lot of relationships. <laughs> and that's certainly unfortunate. But the, the dating 30, you know, is helping me to slow my roll. It's helping me to appreciate dating for what it is. It's not um, the be all and end all of get finding the one or mm -hmm. the, you know, getting a girlfriend. It's about... It's a process of growing and maturing so that I can find the right girlfriend. And what if someone's like, hey, Steve, you know, I was on board with this 30 day, 30 dates. I'm on date 10. It's been six months and I really like this one. Yeah. And I, 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 everybody gets to decide that because uh, unfortunately the universe has not made me emperor yet. Uh. So, <laughs> but I think even just planting the idea of 30, in their heads makes 10 sound like nothing. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I had said the number 10, yeah, 10, well, what if I find the right one on number two or mm -hmm. number one? Well, the odds that you're going to at coming from your piece of crap history that you've told me about <laughs> the odds of the very next woman being the right woman yeah. for you. <laughs> and she's going to be perfectly healthy and you two are going to have a perfectly healthy uh, relationship. Those are like slim to none. Mm -hmm. So when I throw out a number like 30, it's like a learning curve. And if somebody did, let's say at number 10 or 15, decide they were going to settle for the, the one they had, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm all for that. You know, if you can check all the boxes and this is, this person is so stellar and so much above the rest that you have been declining, 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 mm -hmm. then fine. You know, it, it's, it's, it's it's more about teaching the process than it is any particular specific number. Okay. Like, so, wouldn't it be odd if I had said twenty eight? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I said thirty because it's a round number. It's easy to remember, mm -hmm. and it it kind of 
you know, for my my clients who are young men just getting out of prison, uh, I've had some clients in their 30s who were incarcerated when they were 16. Mm. Wow. So they spent 16, 17, 18 mm. years in prison. Mm. They have no adult experience whatsoever. Yeah. And they come out of prison and they just want to put your parents put your hands over your children's ears. They want to tear it up. Yeah. They want to just have a lot of fun and they don't want to get serious about anybody. Even if they fall in love, they, they still want to, you know, continue having sex with multiple uh, different options. And I think that that's okay. If, you know, if, if we can get past the moralizing on this subject, I think, if that's what individuals want to do, then they should go ahead and do that mm -hmm. because we're all human. And for those of us are, who are more human than not, um, love is eventually going to become part of the algorithm. Yeah, We're going to want to have a meaningful connection because um, wonderful sex without love really can't compare to wonderful sex with love mm. and it's it's just better so it's i don't i don't care if people want to play the field if they want to party if they want to go out if they want to live their life the way that they do but once they're on the um some well and i think all of those women count by the way you know if if you dated mm. 10 or 15 different women in your party days, Jason, yeah. <laughs> and you were clubbing on a regular basis. I think that uh, all of those count. Yeah. They were part of your learning curve. So through the whole history of, so of from, your life, from my life. So I've reached the number, thankfully. Oh, you've already hit 30. Yeah. Okay. From zero, from, from, you know, zero to 39, but I'm 39. So. Oh, it's okay. Like I, that yeah, your life is over. Your soul, yeah. <laughs> but if, no, but that, but that, that then counts. Then, so I've hit the number. You know, you have, but then you also. I mean, and not to talk out of both sides of my mouth, but I think it, there's a big difference between, let's say, I I was very popular in high school and I dated 15 women, but looking back on it, as I reflect, I was a what do you call it? Oh, yeah, a moron. Yeah. I was, <laughs> if I was a moron through my first 15 dates, then yeah, I would say those don't count. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, so you can decide for yourself if, you know, what, what is your number anyway? Are you up to 60 or 70? 300. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. I, I, I did. I was thinking about it when I was writing this up for this week. I was like, I need to go and make a tally of all this, but. But I was in three serious relationships, two five years, like I said, um, one in high school from like 16 through 21. Wow. One in my 20s from 25 or 26 till 30. And then one in my 30s from like for three years as well. So those are three. But in between those times, I went on one off dates or two dates or three dates or things like that here, here and there. But it was also a lot of it was online dating through apps, which mm -hmm. we know um, that you don't really yeah. love that much. I, I don't I'm so know. disapproving. Do yeah. those count? <laughs> this is me silently yeah. judging you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, getting back to the, your your story or, or anybody like you, it's, you know, there, there's a time in our life when we become awakened. And, and yes. I, I don't mean it in the political sense, you know, of being woke, but just we go through so much of life being dull and, and not really perceptive of what's going on in our lives, what's mm -hmm. happening around us. And then one day there's a, you, ac you actually can probably date it. You can, you can date it to a specific event or some time in your life where things were going on in such a way that it awakened you and your, your intellect is now engaged in a way it wasn't engaged. And I would say, you know, 30 from that point, but again, if it if it turns out to be fifteen, yeah, that's fine too. It's just because the advantage there that you have as mm -hmm. a guy who's thirty something is you have the intellect of a more mature man. You yeah. have you know the ex life experience, and there are a lot of dates that if you were just starting your count now, uh, 
you've already done a lot of dates that you would never want to repeat yeah. and you already know what to look for. You already know what you're not interested in. Yeah. So the number is now has never been meant to be rigid. It's, it's meant to be, when I say it to almost all of my clients, they look stunned. Usually I get a lot of drop jaws uh -huh. where really, what, what are you talking about? I can't do that. And, but, but it, when I explain it and I explain why most people come around and go, okay, yeah, I can see that. I can do that. And that does make sense. Yeah. And I think the same is true again, whether we're talking about men or women. And I, I think, you know, tragically, I've seen those uh, rebound relationships occur, even rebound marriages yeah. occur for people who were late in life, you know, in their 60s or 70s. And, you know, there's that old saying, there's no fool like an old fool. And um, that is really tragic to see where really you didn't think to find out that she had a drinking problem. Yeah. That never occurred to you. I mean, what was the rush? You know, your wife died three months ago and now you're getting married. Yeah. Well, it's a, it seems like it's that pain that like, at least that's the through line with all the stories I've seen of people who've gotten those relationships. I mean, we're more of so like one person I know it's like they remarried and the wife is just on the phone all the time. Like she's just on social media and right. it's just like, and they're not really a couple. They're not even there. I mean, a person's like lives in a Facebook profile. <laughs> right. And I, I just, you know, I feel sick at heart about hearing that. And yet when he looks in the mirror and does his own debriefing, you know, he has to see that he did this to himself and mm. that uh, it's up to him to unwind this and, yeah. and to make it work. So I want to say, I know this is, been a fairly brief conversation i hope it hasn't been tedious for other people i didn't think we'd be talking about it this long because it's a fairly straightforward topic but it's a lot to, yeah, it's not more too <laughs> yeah oh no because i think you know the the problem for the the really needy miserable guy mm -hmm. is uh made clear when i ask him the question or when i make the statement look you want to share your life with some wonderful woman right and mm -hmm. he's yeah of course well to share your wonderful life you have to have one first yeah and right now do you have a wonderful life as i look into his tear stained mm -hmm. eyes and he's <laughs> depressed and he's miserable and feeling sorry for himself mm -hmm. and well uh no so why would any normal woman yeah. want to share your piece of crap life <laughs> That makes no sense whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So the first step is for for the single guys out there who are complaining because they haven't found a girlfriend. Remember, we're not looking for a girlfriend. We're looking for the right girlfriend. The first step is develop a life worth living. Pretend that all the women on the planet, or for the women, pretend that all the men on the planet have died. Mm -hmm. Would you go out and kill yourself right now? <laughs> well, no. Most of us would figure out a way to make the best of things before we too died of old age. Mm. And so that's the, that's the challenge. It's like a, a giant and complicated Rubik's cube sort of problem. How can I develop a life worth living? Even if I don't have a girlfriend? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, like figure out your interests, your, you know, figure out your tribe. What kind of group of people do you want to hang out with? Mm. What are you doing with your career? What are you doing with your friendships? and your your beliefs and everything else that makes you you and when you've developed a life that's truly worth living guess what happens to all that neediness and depression oh yeah it evaporated because mm -hmm. now you have a life worth living yeah and then normal women will find you attractive not all of them right but mm -hmm. the right ones will find you attractive and and it and you don't have to even hunt them down yeah. It's not like you have to worry about it. You'll just, um, as they say, I think in AA, in the 12 traditions, this is a program of attraction rather than promotion. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, how great would it be to meet a woman who's got the same things going on in her life and she's really content and enjoying her life uh, greatly. And she's delighted to meet someone else who is enjoying his life. Mm -hmm. And the two of you are having great conversations. That would be fantastic. Well, that can happen, but 
you got to take care of your end of it first. Yeah. That I think that's one of the, just the biggest things that anybody could do with all that sort of stuff. Cause it, and it really makes you be accountable for your own life. And if you're just sitting around not doing anything, it's like, well, who's to blame for that? Right. Right. I have so many male and female clients over the years who've said, well, I just, I don't have anyone in my life. And they're, they're crying the blues and it, and they are looking for a girlfriend or a boyfriend, but not the right one. Mm -hmm. And you can't even evaluate the right one if you're mentally ill. And FYI, people, depression is a mental illness. Mm -hmm. So if you're depressed, if you're miserable, you're not on your game. You're not thinking straight. Yeah. And if you're a parent raising children, you got to tell them this stuff, that it's their job to develop a great life worth living. And maybe that includes going to college. Maybe it includes starting a business or uh, getting into a trade or, but whatever it is, whatever that looks like, each one of us should be learning how to have a great life. It's the 21st century. We live in America. If we can't have a great life under these conditions, mm. we've got bigger problems yeah. than finding a girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> how do you, um, how did you, I guess, when you were on your 30 date journey, how many would you say that you've done you did before you got married before again. i settled before you <laughs> <laughs> i would yeah. say i dated about 30 you dated about 30 yeah okay. I, and a lot of them were as i described like one offs Wonders. okay and maybe a few were two or three but and some you left or you broke it off with them and others broke it off with you i would imagine no, i always was the one getting dumped it's so sad are you really no oh. okay <laughs> But but it's been a mix of both, right? No, no, it was a mix. It was absolutely. And how a mix. did you deal with rejection? Like, oh, it's a gift, you... and and I, okay. you know, well, yeah, I think you weren't like hurt by it the first time, like coming out of a marriage that was fit, failed, and then you get back in the dating thing, and then you get rejected. Did you have moments where you were struggling with it? Well, by then, you know, I'd done some already. I'd done a lot of work on myself, doing some serious debriefing, really meditating on how I had gotten into that relationship, mm. why I had stayed as long as I did. And one of the important conclusions that I came to that I want to share with everyone is that, you know, getting together with the right, with the wrong partner is not a gift. Mm. So, you know, part of the issue for me, and there's a, there's an old French saying, he who marries in haste repents at his leisure. And I wanted to, to really slow it up a lot more so that my poor little brain could keep up with what was going on and what it was learning. And there were women who gave me the brush off. Uh, some of them, even before the first date, they didn't even get a first date. Some after the first date. How did date. that happen? How did they brush you off before the first date? Oh, they weren't interested. Oh, you went up to them and said, oh, yeah, yeah. they're like, just get, get out here, loser. <laughs> well, thanks. But I, you know, I'm really not interested. It's very flattering. I appreciate it. Oh. And I, I had others who were maybe more abrupt than that, but I, I was really clear in my own mind that I didn't want to be with anyone mm. who wasn't crazy about me. Mm. Now, they didn't have to be crazy about me to go on a first date. Yeah. But if she'd already decided he's not the one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then I was really, I could comfortably accept that because, yeah. you know, although I've been accused of being um, prideful and arrogant, and I have been prideful and arrogant in some ways. I'm not so prideful that I think every woman on the planet will find me irresistible. Uh, and that life has indeed shown me that women find me quite resistible by the thousands. Yeah. They've, they've shown me that. <laughs> and you've seemed to embrace that. I have. I have because I think that it's it's inevitable. It's sort of like... Um, you know, our diets or special dishes we like and other people make a face when you say you really like black eyed peas, mm -hmm. um, but you really like it and it's really one of your favorite dishes or whatever it is that you eat and what you like. And it's the same way in romance that, um, gosh, what's that old English saying? One man's meat is another man's poison. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I'm the same guy who has been um, given the heave ho by many women, but my current spouse of 30 years finds me endlessly fascinating and interesting mm. and as i find her and so it really is about finding the right person i don't believe i'll just go on the record i don't believe for a minute that 
um, that, that that's superstitious saying about um, finding your soulmate. I think we can have many people who are compatible with us to the point where we could build a, a pleasant and enjoyable life together. Yeah. Um, so, gosh, there are only 4 billion women on the planet or females on the planet. And of, of that 4 billion, roughly 1 billion, probably within striking distance of Stephen Ng's age, you know, mm. say somewhere uh, plus or minus 10 or 20 years. And I, out of, out of these huge numbers, I know that the vast majority are not for me as I am not for them, mm. but there's gotta be hundreds or thousands or maybe even hundreds of thousands. It's mm. just that I'm not going to meet them all. Yeah. You know, nor do I have, nor would I have the time, but with the development of AI. Yeah. <laughs> Just replicate you? <laughs> well, I was just thinking we can have the AI do the search and okay. find the perfect mate. I... <laughs> but the perfect, see, the problem for me, and this is why I went go back to 30 dates, is that I really didn't know, I was naive when it came to humanity and women in particular. I didn't know how wonderful women could be. I had it in my, I mean, I had met wonderful women, like my mother was a wonderful woman, and there were many things I admired about her. But I had no dreams of, I want to marry someone just like mom. You know, yeah. I, that's not what I was thinking. And, but as time went by and I kept meeting one wonderful woman, oh, then another one who was even more intriguing and wonderful in her own mm -hmm. way. And, and, and it's not a qualitative thing where you can, you know, put numbers on it. Like she's a 10 and she's an eight, but it was how much they, they knowing them resonated within my own heart and how great it felt to be around them. And, you know, I can have that that feeling, at least on a superficial level, with a mentally ill woman. Yeah. Uh, because if I meet the right mentally ill woman who's putting a, putting a lot of attention on me and um, acting as if she really loves me, I have a, I had, in those years, at least, I had a lot of love to give. I'm pretty much spent nowadays and <laughs> exhausted. I don't have any more love to give. But, but I... <laughs> But in those days I did. And for a minute, you know, I think we can all be deceived by someone's charm or their attentions. It's very mm -hmm. flattering and we can be needy. But over time, what I, what I found was that there are, this world is full of amazing, wonderful men and women. And for any of us who are so jaded and so depressed about the, these issues, it's it's really time again to look at ourselves and say, what is it about me that keeps picking people who just don't work? Mm -hmm. You know, what is going on with me? Maybe get the help of a therapist, maybe uh, talk to your friends. But, you know, I mean, there's the simple stories that we've all heard. We've all seen the woman who picks um, four alcoholics in a row or, yeah. or the man or woman who picks four uh, abusive partners in a row. And it's like, okay, those are the easy ones. Mm -hmm. What about the ones that aren't egregiously horrible, but are just unsatisfying over time? That takes a, a more subtle level of insight, a little more sophistication. Mm -hmm. And the humility to accept that, you know, I guess I am the kind of guy who needs X or Y. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, there's nothing wrong with this woman. It's just, she's just not working for me. I can't tell you how many wonderful women I met who were absolutely perfect for somebody else. Mm. <laughs> I mean, but they, yeah, it's not, to, I'm not trying to take away anything from them. Yeah. They were amazing women. I met a lot of amazing women, but I could see that merely being amazing is not, does not take into account the, the need for some compatibility. And how did you feel breaking it off with these women? Like, would you feel bad about yourself? Like, what are your thoughts on that? Because sometimes people get in relationships or they're day, oh, she's perfect, but I, I, uh, but this isn't there, but I can't break it off because I don't want to hurt the feelings. Yeah, that's a codependent <laughs> thing, isn't it? That we hmm. we tell ourselves, we don't consciously tell ourselves this, but we have internalized an irrational belief that somehow we have control over another person's feelings. Mm. And that's simply not true. We have control over our behavior. I can control whether I'll treat a woman 
in a civil manner or rudely, for example, and I'm responsible for that behavior because I am in control of it. But I don't have the control over making a woman fall in love with me. Mm -hmm. Um, What a world that would be. (laughs) No, that would be a terrible option because it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be love, right? It would be programming of an automaton. And, and so uh, to be actually with someone who loves me is, is not in my control, nor is it in my control to hurt her when I'm behaving in a respectful manner and I'm terminating a relationship. Mm -hmm. And honestly, for all I know, I just made her day because she just met Fabio and she is ready. She was ready to go, but she was feeling sorry for me. And now that I've, um, you know, done her this big favor and moving on, Mm -hmm. she's free, free to go ahead and explore that side of her life. And so some women are going to be feeling hurt or disappointed. Others are going to be feeling relieved. Others, so others are going to be feeling ecstatic. Mm-hmm. It's over the nightmare. I don't have to put up with this conversation anymore. And it's all good. It's about that. All, all of those emotional responses are about that person who's feeling those feelings. Mm-hmm. And that is about her and her history. It has nothing to do with me. So if you're the person getting rejected or breaking up with, it's all good. It's all good. It's all a gift. Yeah, it really is because mm-hmm. I don't want to be with somebody who's not crazy about me. Yeah. Nor do I want to be with somebody I'm not crazy about. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, just, you know, very seldom do single people consider what they're giving up when they form a committed relationship with someone. But they are giving up a certain level of freedom. Yeah. You know, the freedom to just come and go as you please without consideration of anyone else's feelings or how it impacts their life. The freedom to quit a job or to take a new job or to do, to, to move or, or yeah, to move. Um, you're giving up freedom, you're giving up privacy, and you're giving up so many other options. Mm-hmm. Because let's say you're in a committed relationship when really what you'd like to be doing is you know, revisiting your party years and and going back to when you were footloose and, and enjoying the hell out of that time of your life. Yeah. And now back that you're club days, right now <laughs> that you're now that you're in a committed relationship, you realize, oh my gosh, I boy did I make a big mistake. Mm-hmm. And that's all okay, but it I think that needs to be taken into account by the the wise person to say, you know, yeah, I really do love her, but the truth is the offer that she's putting on the table is not worth my giving up my freedom mm-hmm. and my options and, you know, my other choices that I would like to make my privacy included. Um, and, and women could say that about a guy. Uh, why would any of, I'm, you know, things have changed so much over the last hundred years and, uh, no, I haven't been alive all of those years, but, uh, but people used to, my grandparents used to, in in their era, they were getting married because they needed a spouse to handle life, Mm -hmm. you know, to handle, um, the, uh, business of creating an income, uh, having children, taking care of the children, Somebody had to do the laundry, which was very time consuming a hundred years ago, uh, making the meals, all of that. Now, I mean, unless you're like totally incompetent, most of us can do our own laundry. We can learn to be cooking meals that are nutritious and delicious for ourselves. And if you can't do that, you have to watch lessons in chemistry um, because Brie Larson knows how to do that. So you should learn how to do that too. And it's, that's part of being an adult is the capacity to take care of oneself. Mm -hmm. I don't need a woman anymore, like in the 1800s to literally pull the plow while I'm uh, directing it, you know, making sure the furrows are straight. I don't need any of the other things. I, I can have a great life on my own. That is the wonder of this modern age. Mm. And I think Uh, Thank God, you know, women have made so much progress in terms of being free and um, and having their agency respected that they, too, 
single women can have a great life. They don't have to get married to have a decent standard of living. Mm -hmm. And, and I, and if they think they do, they really need to think again because it might, may mean they need to go back to school or they need to look a little harder at their career because that too would be something I would be looking at. I don't yeah. just like the women that you and I would be thinking about dating. They don't want to be treated as if they were merely sex objects. Right. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean they don't want to be sexual objects. Of course they want us to think about them in that way. Yeah. I mean, that would be the normal way of things, but in the same manner, I don't know any man who wants to be considered as a success object, mm -hmm. some sort of walking wallet. Yeah. I would, you know, what I think most normal people want is a genuine partnership where we're in it together. We're building something worth having together as a team. Otherwise, I can just build it my own little thing on my own. Yeah. And then you also say that should elevate your life and the other person's life. Right. So there has to like, be. It has to be some sort of elevation to leave your perfect. If you're creating the life worth living and you're loving that, you're not going to give that up to go down a notch. Right. If she too has a life worth living, then we get to get come together. And as Khalil Gibran, the, the, you know, says in the prophet, you know, he talks a lot about partnership and now the, the two of us are free to really share our lives. We, mm. we can't share our lives if we don't have one. Mm. And if her life is utterly empty and she's dependent on me to be the uh, what we used to call in the 60s, the home entertainment center. I don't want to have the responsibility for entertaining a partner. Yeah, I want her to have her own life, her own friends, her own activities. And yes, I want to share some of all that with her. But I, I think all of us, you know, as a father of both a son and daughters, I want all of my children to be able to have a life of their own where if something happens to their partner, uh, or there's a divorce, some kind of breakup. I don't want their life to be turned upside down and ruined, mm -hmm. destroyed, devastated. Uh, it should be no more than just being profoundly hurt or disappointed, but not devastated. Devastated speaks of total destruction. Yeah, you know, uh, the, the atomic bomb went off in your in your <laughs> life. None of us should be that uh, hapless. Or yeah. helpless in our lives. I've had that, but <laughs> yeah, that experience. Yeah, Condol recently. Oh man, condolences. Well, not, not, but with my last relationship, because I had I lost my real my. Well, it's like my best friend of twenty years, and his girlfriend chose to be friends with my ex over me. So lost the best friend and lost the girlfriend at the same time. So it was like the universe really slapped me pretty hard, and then pretty hard. The wow. lesson came out of it was really seeing not only how I want to be treated with my friends, but also relationship wise. And so it's like, that's been, and then working through all that and understanding what I need doing the debriefing. So yeah, it was really, that was an intense one. And that's then, very intense. Whoa. Yeah. And then from like, yeah, just doing all the work, everything that we talk about, the intentional interviews, the debriefing, creating a life worth living. It's like applying all those things and then doing all the dating as well, trying to get, ground zero from or from 30 or starting to get that 30 dates under my belt and meeting different people and all that were there other friends in your circle besides just him yeah that's a it's a whole long story with him so he kind of came in when i was younger when i was 18 and um i had a whole core group of friends before them and they never really liked him that <laughs> <laughs> what? but it was like but there were signs going out throughout the whole friendship that like there were a few times we didn't talk for a bit and there was always kind of like some dramas the way he treated me sometimes and i just kind of like let it go let it slide and all that sort of stuff and then i let it go for like 20 years and accepted the some of the behaviors that i wouldn't now and then yeah then that's the the price of wisdom isn't it mm -hmm. there's a norse myth that uh when Odin, father of the gods, wanted, uh, he asked for wisdom and he was told that the price was uh, his eye. He had to pluck out his yeah. eye out of his head. And that's why, that's why I'm wearing an eye patch. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and, and is it worth it? I would say, yeah. What price wisdom? Whatever it costs. 
Yeah. It, it, whatever it costs, it's worth it. And, and the beauty for you is learning it as young as you were. Mm -hmm. And so now you're much more uh, cognizant of who's in your life and who's not. Yeah. What is a real friend? Mm -hmm. um, also the value of those other friends in your circle. Yeah. And this happened to me as well, where I had, I had friends cautioning me about uh, a couple of the women I dated. Mm. And in those days I was really given to arguing mm. because I was always right. You see, right. and I knew that. I don't know why the universe yeah. didn't know that, <laughs> but I, I, and I would argue with them. And then I, I realized what had happened and I had been so very wrong. And I came back and I apologized to my friends mm. because it had cost them something. It had cost them to gently and kindly as they could to confront me about my really awful choice. Yeah. And instead of arguing with them to just accept that, Hey, these are guys who really care about me and they're taking this risk to at least give their words, the dignity of a, of a hearing out. And even if I don't agree to put those words on a shelf for checking later, mm -hmm. you know, and just, it doesn't cost me anything to just hold on to these words and just check, take them for checking. Yeah. And sure enough, I mean, there are going to be friends who make mistakes about even the best possible choice. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, and that happened to me as well. But when, once I realized I didn't have to convince the whole world of who was right and who was wrong for me, mm -hmm. uh, but I could just listen without needing to engage in the argument. Yeah. And it was very liberating, but that took pain. I had to go through pain, pain to get to that. to get there. Yeah. yeah. And I, I don't know any, you know, there's a saying again that comes out of AA. There's so many wonderful sayings. Um, but one I heard in a group years ago was nobody changes until the pain gets bad enough. Yeah, that's a great one. I yeah. think that's very true. <laughs> it's been true in my life. Yeah, and, same. you know, instead, but instead of, as they say in AA, hitting bottom, my bottom can rise. I don't have to hit bottom like all the way down at where i'm bankrupt and i'm depressed and i have mental illness i don't have mm -hmm. to lose everything i can just uh like is the example with your friend who betrayed you i can just oh he's a guy who's controlling and and disrespectful um this is the third time he's done that even though i confronted him yeah we're done so yeah. you can you can hit bottom you know at a very light and easy level yeah and it's you know and that's kind of what wisdom has taught me is mm -hmm. i don't need to wait until things get disastrous to make a decision well yeah and that's another reason why i like i like doing this sort of stuff because it's like it can maybe help people get out of a situation <laughs> or maybe avoid some things i mean so yeah yeah and i mean that's not to say they'll not people like that you can never completely escape from pain probably but you could also you could also kind of guide your life in a way that it's minimized i know yeah you know i've been uh criticized for turning romance into some kind of a science and that <clears throat> making it sound as if there were guarantees that one would never be unhappy or guarantees one would never be disappointed and that that's not the case in any of these conversations we're having i'd i'd want to be the first person on the record to say that all we're talking about is how to dramatically raise the odds of success mm -hmm. by stacking the cards in your favor through some behavioral changes you're in control of. So, for example, the guy who's going on all of his dates liquored up because he's shy and he feels <laughs> uncomfortable and he's always got to get a couple drinks in him before he can relax. Yeah, that guy's not going to be clear-headed and, uh -huh. and seeing things. And sobriety would be a reasonable goal for <laughs> such a fellow. So... Uh, or such a woman. So I, uh, yeah, I, I, I think this, the 30 dates is just meant to be a fun idea and not a horrifying idea by any means. In fact, all, I think most of my ideas are more fun to engage in than people might think. Mm. They're not so much, uh, rules. You know what I think, why I think people think the, the, the negative, I think it's because so many of our relationship guides, so much of our relationship guidance so many of the rules that we've heard come from either an authority figure like a parent. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't date that kind of girl or the church. Yeah. And 
both situations, it's about shame and control. And I'm just talking about engaging in a safe way so you're free and safe to learn. Yeah. And that's it. So start dating people. <laughs> 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 All right, great. So um, I'm going to wrap it up there. And we have a listener question to answer. So and again, if you do have a question for Steve, you could visit stevening.com and fill out the contact form. And some of these are hard too. the questions. Yeah, yeah you give me like, some hard like ones. a test. So <sighs> all right, here, the, here we go. This one's a little long, not super long. But um, the question is my my husband retired without discussing it with me. I'm still working and still taking care of the house and making dinner. And he literally does nothing all day, but watch TV and YouTube videos. I'm so angry at my husband's laziness that I have no interest in having sex with him to make matters worse. I think he's looking at porn while I'm at work because he seems less interested in sex too. I'm so mad. I don't know how to talk to him about this. What do you advise? Yeah. Wow. Well, you know, these are real people with real stories and, and that's, that's such a painful one, right? Um, but it reminds me a lot of myself in that. Um, I, In my desire to remain in control of myself, I have held back honest feedback from the people around me, whether it's a friend or a significant other. And the gift in honest feedback is not really for the other person. It's really for myself. To because if I don't speak out loud, I don't really know what my feelings are. Mm -hmm. That's what I've learned. Mm -hmm. And and the the Bible said it this way that out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. And I think that that's that's true. If we open our mouths and we start talking, hey, could I talk to you about something? Oh, what's up? Well, I wanted to share some feelings with you. I've been fucking miserable for the last six <laughs> months ever since you retired. And I think we need to talk about that or we're going to end up getting divorced. Well, there's the icebreaker. I yeah. mean, that really gets the party started. <laughs> <laughs> and to and and maybe some of us need to, you know, crack the bottle of champagne over the hull of the destroyer as it's leaving the the um port where it was built. But I know that I I need to again take personal responsibility for speaking up. She's probably right about the porn. She's probably because you know she. I'm guess I don't know how long she's been married to that guy, but I'm guessing that she has an idea about what his normal sexual appetite is. Mm -hmm. And if he's not sexually interested in her anymore, suddenly now that he's retired, that's weird in my mind. Because if I had a lot more time, I'd probably be chasing my wife around the house. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't think. Um, so I don't think she's off. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm, I'm at a loss to explain the, the idea that she's doing, she's still at work full time where he's not doing any chores around the house. And I'm thinking, wow, I mean, this, this might sound like a reversion to, uh, uh, a stereotype out of the sixties, but if she's working eight hours a day at some job and bringing home the money to support the family, uh, I think it's really fair that he would pick up all the housekeeping chores because it's just the two of them. Apparently yeah. I'm thinking as at their age, they don't have others living with them. And mm -hmm. so he could do the cooking, uh, except maybe on the weekends, she might want to do some cooking. Yeah. Uh, he could do the cleaning for sure. Uh, I'm hoping that he does all the laundry, including the bedding and, and that sort of thing. She shouldn't be be doing much, I don't think, um, except maybe some of the things she wants to do. And if she wants to do some cooking, that's fine. If she wants to garden, that's fine. But I think something that if there's if there is an equity in the sense of fairness, mm -hmm. um, then what the hell are we doing here? Yeah. That isn't right. So if if we if we had a a piece of cake on le the last piece of cake, and we had to split it. We would want to split it fairly between the two of us. Well, we're at the last quarter of their life. They're in their retirement retirement years. They've got maybe 20, 30 years ahead of them. And to figure out how, how are we going to live now? And yeah, in hindsight, we should all be talking about this before we actually do retire. 
But, you know, one of the crazy things about this story is he retired without even talking to her. Mm. And that tells you so much about this relationship because they, they, for some, somehow that became the norm. Yeah. And she didn't pitch a fit then either. Mm -hmm. She didn't say what? (laughs) (laughs) Or she didn't have a negotiation then about chores and splitting Mm -hmm. the workload fairly between the two of them. And so he, he was just going with what their normal was. Yeah. And she's always been doing, you know, pulling double shifts, going to work full time, coming home, working. And for some reason, she didn't notice. Or if she did notice, she just thought it was the way things were supposed to be. Well, things are supposed to be fair. And if, and by fair, I mean mutually pleasing. I don't mean we have to measure the caloric expenditure of each individual's work and see who's, you know, working more or less and then even out the score. No, it's whatever feels fair and is satisfying to each one uh, if they can live with that deal. Mm-hmm. But that counts. That That's really up to her to speak up because he's got a sweet deal. Yeah. Yeah. YouTube and TV are. That's, you, that's, that's YouTube, my dream. TV, <laughs> and he's having porn with beautiful women from all over the world. I assume they're women or small farm animals or whatever, whatever he's involved in. Uh, And, and eventually if he keeps this up, he'll become a client of mine too. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. The world needs more sex offenders. Uh, (laughs) Well, yeah. So, and then that pretty much sums it up. So they, they need to have a conversation. Yeah. Well, they may not need to, she needs to. to, Yeah. Yeah. And and I think divorce is not out of the question. Mm -hmm. If he, Proves uh, unyielding and rigid, and he likes what he likes, and this yeah. is the way it's going to be. I would say, wow, this would be a great time to get a divorce then, because yeah. he's quit his job. You've got a, you're a single income person. You mm-hmm. can go ahead and have a life. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. Well, thank you for that question, and thank you all for listening. And we'll catch you all next week. <laughs> <laughs>